Now, uh, part of the advice is going to be be active, so I'm uh, going to suggest to you that you have a piece of paper and pen in front of you, so you, even if you throw it out at the end of the period, you can jot down words or draw pictures or do do or something. Okay, um, so what I'm looking at is some advice um, on what's our focus between now and the first mock, and then um, I'm going to finish with some suggestions for strategies in the mock, uh, and we'll look at those again. I'll, I'll redo that bit the day before we finish for this first block in, um, uh, in um, week four. Um, so that um, you're fresh on those, but I just want to look over all. Start Michael with a Jordan. short video called The Learning Stick, which you may have seen before. Player. In fact, the most successful North American athlete of all time, he holds the NBA record for the highest regular season scoring average and highest playoff scoring average. He came from humble beginnings, and to get where he did, he needed to be focused and to work hard. But to do this, and above all else, he needed to be resilient. To be resilient means to be able to withstand or recover quickly from difficult conditions. He once famously said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. He recognises that failure is a necessary part of success. Without failing, you can't learn. Because it's when we're confused, when things go wrong, when we hit a problem and don't know how to fix it, the real, deep and powerful learning begins. To help illustrate this idea, it's useful to think of this as a visual metaphor called the learning bit. First, we're faced with a problem. Given a task introduced to a new idea, we may feel apprehensive or worried that we may not be able to do it. It's at this point that we have to leap into the pit. The only way to resolve the problem is to move forward, jump in and have a go. Sometimes this can take guts and determination. <coughs> when we first face obstacles in a task and we find ourselves at a dead end, we're at the bottom of the pit. You may feel that you don't want to speak out in class for fear of getting the answer wrong, or are so confused you don't know how to start. It is at this point that we must move through this, sense of fear and begin to try. Once you start applying different approaches or techniques, you begin to learn. You will make mistakes, but once you have, you will be able to think about what went wrong and how to fix it. This way, you will develop a much deeper understanding of what you're learning. The learning pit is about learning to know what to do when you don't know what to do. When you're finally out of the pit and see what you've achieved, you'll feel an overwhelming sense of achievement and satisfaction. But even more important than this, you will have developed resilience, which will continue to help you long after you've left school. The next time you face it. Okay. In, um, in learning theory, this is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, you might have come across this before. Now, I'll just mention that um, Jack and Don have just sucked through this. That's why they're working on our eyes at the moment. Okay, they're not being rude. Um, we're good. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect is often... Um, quoted as um, dumb people don't know they're dumb, um, but it really means that people who don't really understand things often don't realise that they don't understand things. Uh, and the graph for it uh, looks like this, that if you're looking at developing competence in a subject, in a topic, okay, um, you have an axis from I know nothing to I'm the guru on this topic, um, and you have another axis which is about confidence with the material. Now when you're first introduced to something, you generally get a huge surge of confidence. You think, oh yeah, I understand that. Okay? Um, and you think, falsely, that um, that means you're competent at it. We call that Mount Stupid on the graph. Right? Because you're overconfident. You, you, you haven't yet been challenged in it. 
you haven't had to think about it, there's no level of confusion. Um, and usually when you are challenged in it, you fall into what we call the valley of despair. So your confidence drops, but your competence is in fact increasing at this point. Now there are enormous studies at the moment in the physical sciences um, amongst undergraduate students, so degree level students, um, about the need for confusion. That if a student is never confused about a topic, is never struggling with a topic, they don't reach mastery of it. They cannot reach mastery of it as quickly as if they are confused and they resolve that confusion. Okay? So, um, somewhere in here we want Mach 1. And between Mach 1 and Mach 2 we want to start <laughs> climbing the slope of enlightenment, is what it's called, towards the plateau of sustainability. Now this comes, the, these names come from um, business education jargon, so it, it, they're a bit twee. But we're aiming for you to be there at the external exam. Okay. But the whole point of this is to recognise that that's normal. And over the next 13 weeks, if you're not experiencing challenge and confusion and sometimes thinking, how the hell am I going to get my head around this, then you're not going to be ready for the exam. You're not going to be as prepared as you could be for the exam. Okay? You're going to keep a superficial level of understanding. Um, and then questions are going to throw you on the real exam. All right? So do not be afraid of, over the next 13 weeks, that's why we've got, that's why, the, this is the whole reason why we have planned the course such that, we've got this revision time, is to be able to deal with this in a systematic, logical way so that you can make sure you're up at that top level. Okay? The other part of the research that you need to be aware of, and I forget who, whose name is associated with this, it's a long name, um, but you've seen this before, I'm sure, that if you teach something to somebody and, you, and the students try and learn it, then the amount that you retain over time drops off exponentially. Okay? The next day you might remember 50% of it, the, the day after only 20% of it, the day after only 5% of it, and so on. But that if you revisit the stuff on a regular pattern, the slope of the exponential graph gets less until eventually you can keep up at very high levels by just retouching on it at larger and larger intervals. Okay. This is the whole theory and, and experience and research behind space practice, spaced practice. So getting into the habit of every week going through your entire dot points in a subject, for example, means that you'll be on this red line, not this red line, come the exam. Okay. So this is the rationale and the theory of research behind spaced practice. That is regularly retouching the topics time and time again. Now, um, I've just pulled out some points from slides that I used at the start of the year. Uh, what do you need to do during your revision period? So between now and the first mock, between the first mock and the second mock, how do you do things? I'm not talking about the, the strategies, the topics and that sort of stuff. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, overall, what is the research telling us? Wherever possible, work with pen and paper if you're trying to learn stuff. Okay? Um, for a whole lot of reasons, but none less than it slows us down and requires psychomotor action. So that actually allows us to process things in our brains more effectively. The second reason is that it, it introduces and involves other senses other than vision. We have to use our muscles. We, have to, we feel the paper. We can smell the paper. It uses other senses. The more senses you can involve, the more senses you can engage in encountering the material, 
the more likely you are to actually remember it. It's strange, but true. Okay. Secondly, I don't care what you feel like. The research, some of it is e equivocal. Some of it says, yeah, certain types of, you know, Baroque music is good. No. Other, most of the research says don't. It simply uses the same bandwidth in your brain that you're using to think. Uh, and guys come back to me and say, yeah, but, uh, you know, I, I, I work much more effectively listening to music. That's bullshit. It's more enjoyable listening to music, but you are sacrificing your processing power, so you are accepting less bang for your buck by doing it. And I get it. I understand, you know, listening to music. That's fine. So I would suggest to you, if it's important to you, listen to music for five minutes, then study for 25 minutes without it. Then take a break for five minutes, listen to another track. Whatever. But don't fool yourself into thinking that you are more effective when you... No. Other guys come to me and say, it blocks out all their distractions. It creates a distraction that overpowers other distractions, yes. So get yourself a pair of noise-cancelling headphones and don't play music through them. In fact, last year's guys, JPW and a few others like that, that's exactly what they did at Afternoon and Shoots. They put on their noise-cancelling headphones and they didn't plug them into anything. Right. I've got a set of noise-cancelling earbuds I use on trains. I can't even hear the announcements on a train when I use the noise cancelling earbuds, and I don't play anything through it. I just have them sitting in my ears. Um, that was confirmed by a research study out of um, Newcastle Grammar just recently. They said exactly the same things as, my, as our kids said last year. You know, If they're studying over there in ST or, or whatever, they'd put them on so that you wouldn't get any noise. Um, no phone smartwatches in the room. Now, the research on this is quite clear and it's up on Moodle on the tutorial page. The smartphone occupies part of your bandwidth, your brain's bandwidth, even if it is powered down and turned over on the desk. Okay? Um, put it in another room, put it on charge somewhere in another room. In fact, only use screens if necessary. Uh, when we go into revision mode after the second, individual revision mode after the second mock, and we're giving you, you know, a mock exam, a new mock exam to work on each week, I'm going to give it to you on paper. It'll be up on Moodle as well, and the solutions and so on, but I'm going to give it to you on paper because there is nothing that replaces doing it on paper away from a screen. Okay? Screens are just too distracting and in evolutionary terms, we have not evolved to learn from them in exactly the same way as we, we learn from the tactile sensation of working with paper. Secondly, on the exam day, you are working with paper. Therefore, you need to get physically in that flow. Okay. Um, now, obviously, you're going to, um, any time you're spending on this, you're going to chunk it up with short breaks, um, but don't check your phone during the break. Don't turn the computer on during the break, unless there's some particular reason you need to. Okay? Don't just compulsively go to a screen, uh, because you're changing the way your brain acts in that two or three minute break, and then you're trying to switch back. Okay? If you're, gonna, if you're on a study break, you know, you might have worked for 25 minutes, you've got five minutes, and you're going to go for another 25 minutes. In that five minutes, do something congruent with what you've been doing. And what you've been doing is lateral or, or, or linear processing. So go for a walk, eat a snack, talk to somebody, do something that involves that part of the brain. Don't try and switch to something else, which is playing a game or... or Reading the screen, okay? Uses a different part of the brain. Um, always think about how you're working. This is metacognition. 
thinking about thinking. Don't just do three hours of study and then at the end of it say, okay, well, that's done. Give it two minutes to say, to look back and reflect and say, okay, I've just spent three hours of my life on this. What do I, what do I get out of it? What, what do I do well? What do I do poorly? Next time when I sit down, what should I do? You know? The room was too hot and I kept having to get up and do things and you know, well, I'll change it next time. But think about what you're doing. Okay? Finally, and there's a, the, this study is up on Moodle on the, on the tutorial page also, seriously beware distraction. And this is why in the afternoon shoots I'll, I'll sometimes rouse some people for just having a quick word with somebody. You know? Um, the studies, and this was in a business environment and in um, undergraduate uh, study groups, every distraction, either the phone going off or a notification or an email coming through or somebody walking past your desk saying hello, reduced effectiveness for up to 20 minutes afterwards. When you're in flow and you're getting things done, okay, I will rouse if you, uh, if you turn to somebody and don't say, well, it was only five seconds. You're not affecting just that five seconds. You're actually affecting both of you for up to the next 20 minutes in terms of the flow. So just have the self-regulation, have the self-discipline to think, yeah, I had that thought. I'd like to tell Nash that thought, but I'm going to tell him later. We're working. You know? Um, None of you, none of us, no human being can multitask. It is not physically possible for our brains to multitask. We are linear processes. We aren't good at multitasking. We are very good at switching quickly between tasks, and we're very good at believing that that's multitasking, but it's not. We are linear processes. So if you're trying to do two things at once, um, know that you're continually switching back and forth between the two, and that counts as a distraction every time you switch back and forth, and therefore you're working at suboptimal levels. Okay. Uh, the research is quite clear that if you have a plan, I'm not talking goal setting, I'm just saying if you have a plan, um, you can reduce your stress. Okay. Now, what would I suggest? Well, I've done a plan for what we're doing as a class for the next 14 weeks. It's up on Moodle, it's in Excel. Excel is infinitely variable. You can go through and delete all my stuff and put your own plan in, or you could um, download it, add a row to each week, and put your own stuff in, okay? But get yourself a plan, get yourself a schedule so you know what you have to do and you've got it all in there, okay? If you want to delete all my stuff and just leave the days and put all your subjects in there, doesn't matter. But, but make yourself a plan. Okay? Um, if possible, print it out, put it on the fridge so that the whole family knows this is my plan. That helps. You know? You're going to wash up? No, but look, not on the plan. All right, dot point summaries. Um, The dot point summaries are our secret weapon. Okay? They are our superpower. Now, only if you use them properly. Okay? Um, last year's guys, one of them quoted and said, literally force every kid to do it. Okay? Um, most powerful thing that we can do. Uh, interestingly, the strategy also came up and I haven't seen this before, but the strategy also come up almost word for word in the Newcastle Grammar uh, research report. Um, they talked about uh, the, the extraordinary value of their syllabus dot point summaries. Um, we hadn't seen any of that in the HSC. We hadn't looked at any of that technique or anything. Um, our kids came up with this the end of year 11, two years ago. Anyway, um, in terms of the, the learning it, spacing it out, spaced practice helps retention, okay? So you revisit them regularly throughout the term. For the next 13 weeks, you really should aim 
to revisit all chem dot points every week. Now what will happen is, the first time you try and do it, it'll take nine hours. No, it'll take, you know, a fair bit of time, three hours or so, like we did at the tutorial on the holidays. By week five or six of the program, it'll take 90 minutes. By the external exam, you'll be able to do it in just under an hour because you're becoming much more familiar with it, you know, more second nature to you. Um, so spaced practice, strategy 1B, okay, in terms of learning things, strategy 1B. 1A, on the other hand, is active recall. We'll get to that. Uh, when you're reviewing dot points, always start in different places. Otherwise, you will know 311 bloody brilliantly, but there'll be a gap later on. Okay. Um, thirdly, uh, mixing up, interleaving uh, the dot points um, is always good practice from this point forward, interleaving. Uh, and for that end, to that end, that PowerPoint that I used at the tutorial on the holidays and I've put up on Moodle, where on the first slide you can press a button and shuffle all the dot points that follow, is a good way of, of ordering them. Okay? Uh, interleaving is good because it requires your brain to go from equilibrium to organic nomenclature to whatever else, acid base and so on. And that's exactly what you're going to have to do on the exam. Okay. When do you stop interleaving and dive into massed practice or blocked practice in one topic? When you find a lack. So when you identify in week three that on the Dunning-Kruger curve, you are in the valley of despair when it comes to acid-base equilibria, then you stop interleaving and you spend two or three days on mass practice in acid-base equilibria. And then you revert back. Yes? So when you're reviewing your dot points, you find something that you don't know. Do you mark it down and say, I need to do mass blocked on this, and then I continue? Would. I or would. You, um, yeah, yeah, I would. Okay, yeah, yeah. so you finish reviewing them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would. Um, I would I would then go to my schedule and say, oh, I had planned to do this, this, and this, but that's gone out the window. I'm now doing acid-base equilibria for the next three days, and I'm not going to give it up until I'm up on that Dunning-Kruger curve. You know? Um, this is why, as soon as you need to work individually instead of all together, I'm happy for you to peel off. Uh, still stay in the room somewhere, put your noise cancelling headphones on, and get on with what you need to do. Okay? So, between the two, mo uh, yeah, between the two mocks, we're going to do revision mini lessons on, on the topics that you're. Weakest on on Mach 1, I'm going to do little lessons, I'm going to record them, put them up on Moodle, but if that's not what you need at that point in time, then you just tell me and you peel off and you come back. Yes? Okay. Um, now, strategy 1B was space practice. Strategy 1A, the absolute superpower for us, is active recall. Okay? Um, sitting, looking, writing... Reading, these are useless things. Active recall is the way you learn something. And both words are important. Active. Don't just, don't think you're ever studying if you're sitting at a desk. I don't think that's, that's possible. Okay? If you're sitting at a desk, you will very quickly be starting to think about something else, and you'll start to get tired and so on. I always, when I first learnt this, I always study standing up. It's active. All right? You've got a whiteboard over here, you've got your notes on the desk. You can't fall asleep when it's hard to fall asleep if you're standing up. Uh, active is, is important, but active recall is the, is the physical act of trying to remember something. So, this is where summaries, flashcards, that sort of stuff comes into its own. Okay? Using flashcards, I would still stand up and walk around and talk it out loud. Um, using flashcards is one way of active recall. Why? Because it says on the front, equilibrium constant. And on the back, you've got to remember, okay, well, that equilibrium constant is the product of the products over the product of the reactants. And this is what it means. Um, now, you mightn't use flashcards for it. I didn't use flashcards when I was your age, but I did do all my summaries with 
the title down the left hand side and the detail down the right hand side so that I could cover the detail, have it on the desk and say okay well bang 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 okay I, this first definition is this and then now I pull it down and say yes it is, no it's not, okay well no it's not I need to learn it, yes it is I can move on, All right? so it's the act of trying to recall that really drives home the long term memory um, but it's important that when you recall, you always check because the technique will make it permanent. It doesn't make it perfect. It doesn't make it correct. If you're remembering the wrong thing, you will simply make that permanent. Okay? So recall and then check always. Make sure it's right. Um, and I've said this to you many times before. <laughs> Repetition is the key. Um, that if you're trying to learn something, repetition is the key. If you're trying to learn one of these definitions that, that, that define things, and there's much fewer in chemistry than there is in physics to find things, um, but if you're trying to learn those things off, repetition is the key, and repetition verbally is the trick, not writing them out, because writing them out you will very quickly be um, circumventing the link between your brain and your hand, and your hand will keep writing and you'll be thinking about something else. Okay. And that's a total waste of time. Reading them is a total waste of time. Saying them out loud is, um, is good because I believe it's physically impossible to daydream while you're speaking out loud. Okay, so shut yourself in your room. Right? The, Le Chatelier's principle says that and so on. And just talk it out. If you're talking it, you can get 16 repetitions done in the time it takes to write it out twice. Yes? So we're doing like practical work, like solving a problem. Do you think we should speak out? Verbalise it as well. And say what? No, was people will think you're crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, look, if you can, yes. Um, again, that's a matter of bringing more senses to the party. Instead of just using vision and so on, you're um, using auditory processing as well. Um, so that's this next point. Wherever you can, use visual stimulus. Um, one of the reasons I would walk around when I was studying things was that I'd, we didn't have whiteboards in those days, but I had a chalkboard in my bedroom and I could simply go up and, and draw a formula or draw a diagram or something, which would save a lot of time of trying to enunciate something. Right? So there are visual cues as well as auditory cues and that going on. So use visual stimulus wherever you can. Okay. Now, that's tips for how do you actually learn stuff. I'm just going to go very quickly through what do I want you to try and do in the, in the mock? Okay? Um, and it's important to me, guys, because I could do this two days before the real exam and you could get all fired up and say, I'm going to go th do those, but as soon as you get in there, it's going to go out the window as you feel the pressure of the exam. I, I want you to try some of these in the first mock, refine them in the second mock, and make them automatic when you're doing the in class mocks, so that when you come to the real exam, it's, this is just what you do. Okay? And I'm not saying do all of these, I'm saying in the first mock, find out what works for you, but try it. Okay? So, um, information about the exam itself, we know it's 50%, um, it's units three and four. Uh, this is from the syllabus. I've just dropped the word science in there because I don't want to, didn't want to take, make two PowerPoints, one for chemistry and one for physics, right? Um, now, this is interesting. Um, the assessment objectives, and I've just blocked out the topics. The assessment objectives on the external exam are objectives one, two, three, and four. Now, if you look at it, three and four are already examined on the RI and the SE. And the mistake some guys made last year walking into the external exam was thinking it was only going to be describe and explain and apply understanding. In other words, tutorial questions type of thing. And they were surprised and they walked out of the chemistry and the physics exam saying that second paper was more like a data test. Well, yeah, 
analyse evidence to identify trends, patterns and relationships, limitations or uncertainty, and interpret evidence to draw conclusions. You've got to expect that stuff. Okay? So it's one of the reasons why the, the practice exams are important, but it's one of the reasons also why the dot points are the coverage, they're not the type of question. Okay? The type of question can be from any of those four um, objectives. All right. Um, specification, yes. Two 90-minute papers, 10 minutes perusal. We'll look at the 10 minutes. Um, approved equipment, yep, black or blue pens. 2B pencil sharpener and eraser. The pencil is only for multiple choice questions on drawing graphs or diagrams. Black or blue pen must be used for all other written responses. You're allowed a highlighter, a clear plastic ruler, water in a clear unlabeled bottle, and the asthma inhaler is not compulsory unless you have asthma. Okay. And you may put all this in a clear plastic Ziploc bag. Uh, you are not, however, allowed to have any electric, uh, electronic equipment other than the calculator. Correction fluid or tape, dictionaries, erasable pens are not allowed. Uh, blank paper notes, any written material or tissues. We can give you tissues, you can't take them in. Um, now, it said ruler on there, didn't it? Yes, ruler is critical, have a ruler. Okay, I'll explain why in a minute. Before the exam block, um, if you use the calculator for anything other than calculating, stop. If you use the memory of the calculator for anything, stop. Because you will be required to clear the calculator before you move into the exam room. The guys last year were not required to put it in exam mode. Putting it in exam mode takes away some functions. Um, they were not required to do that, but they were required to clear their calculator memory. Okay? And there's a sequence you can, key sequence you can follow to clear your calculator memory, and it's visible to the invigilators that you've done that. Okay? Um, if you put it in an exam mode, you can't take it out of exam mode for 24 hours or something. You know, it, it, it locks it. Um, so the first thing is, if you're in the habit of using a graphics calculator for anything other than calculating, so if you've got constants and things keyed into your calculator, stop doing it because you won't have them. Okay. Secondly, whenever you're doing any of these mock exams or the questions in class or whatever, have your formula and data book in front of you, and if you haven't got one, get another one. Okay. Be so familiar with that formula and data booklet that on the day, you know exactly where everything is. And you're not wasting any moment of the time trying to find the standard reduction potentials or whatever. You know where it is. Right? You can tell by in the dark that you're on the right page. Okay. All right. Um, particularly around the exam blocks, make a plan. And I've taken you through how to make an exam block plan. Uh, and it's up on Moodle. And the video and the PowerPoints are up on Moodle. Um, now at this point, eat well, get plenty of sleep, be kind to yourself, be gentle with your body. This is important. Um, and this is not just about being well rested and so on. Um, and this applies for all 13 and 14 weeks between now and the exam. This is not just looking after yourself, this is part of the learning process. The research is very clear um, that rapid eye movement sleep, which only occurs when you have good quality sleep, um, has been shown to be an essential part of the learning process. I'm sure you've had the, the, the experience where you're trying to learn a physical skill or a cognitive process, and suddenly today you can do it better than you could do it yesterday, uh, but you haven't spent any more time preparing for it. You have. You slept. And that's where the long-term memories are often laid down. The days Memory shuttle is sort of loaded into long-term memory for those things that are important. Um, so the sleep is important for that reason. Okay. Um, guys often ask me, you know, uh, it's the last night before a specialist exam or something. Uh, you know, what should I do? Should I spend extra time studying? No. Finish it in your normal time. Go to sleep. You'll remember things better tomorrow. You go to sleep. Yep. Stop eating well. What sort of foods would you 
Well, we'd carbo load just towards the exam block, but um, seriously, you would. Um, but out here, healthy food. Like raisin toast. And stuff. Go. McDonald's and Hungry Jack's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the actual exam itself, you might already do these things. Uh, during perusal, you've got 10 minutes. You're not allowed to write or hold a writing implement. You're not allowed to use a calculator. So what do you do in the 10 minutes? Well, I'd suggest these four things. And let's look at them one at a time. First of all, check through the entire paper to see what's on it. Now, in the past, your experience might be turning the page and thinking, oh, shit. You know? But that's not going to be your experience in the external exam because we've got 14 weeks to get ready for it and we're going to be up there on the Dunning-Kruger curve. When you first open the paper, look through it and your stress level will drop because you will look through it and you might see one or two questions that you think that even on the course. Um, but the vast majority of them, you'll think, yep, 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 that's right. Okay? So just the act of seeing it reduces your stress levels. Um, the second thing it does is that it hopefully avoids walking out and not having done the last page of the paper. You know? Just have a flick through. Uh, yeah, I've got all those questions right. Now check the last page so that I know where it ends. Um, so that's the first thing is check through. Secondly, um, I would suggest that you work out a rough timing for the exam. Now, the QCAA will not release beforehand the number of marks on each paper. But, so that means in perusal is the first time you know how many marks the paper is assigned. If it's the first paper, you're going to have 20 or 25 or 30 of those marks due to the multiple choice. You need to make a rough plan. If, a, if it's a 90-minute paper and you've got 45 marks, then that's two, mar uh, two minutes per mark roughly. Now, don't be ridiculous about this and say, all right, well, that's a one-mark question, so I'm spending two minutes on that, and that's a three-mark question, I'm spending six minutes on that, and spend all your perusal time working it out and then get yourself in all head up because you've spent one and a half minutes on a question that you've only spent, spent no. Just work in 15-minute or 30-minute blocks and say, okay, multiple choice, it's half the marks of this paper. If I'm finished that in 15 minutes, then I'm doing myself a disservice. Because it should be 45 minutes if it's half the marks. Okay? So just get an idea of this bit of the paper should take me half an hour, this bit of the paper should take me half an hour, and this bit of the paper should take me half an hour. You know? Um, unfortunately, in our exam blocks, they tend to use digital clocks, I would prefer them to put up an analogue clock because I think it's easier just to say, OK, that half hour is this and that quarter of an hour is this. But, I don't know, maybe you guys are digital babies or something. Um, so it's just a mental plan of attack in terms of timing. Okay. Um, and then, thirdly, in perusal, I'd do a quick, which do I want to do first? You do not have to do the questions in order. I would, however, suggest you always do the multiple choice questions in order. Okay? But the other questions, the short answer questions, you might choose to do the harder ones first to get them out of the way, or you might choose to do the shorter ones first to get them out of the way, or the easier ones. But make a plan. Now, most of the questions, you might look at and think, I don't care what order I do those in, but hey, this one, I want to do that first and get it while I'm really fresh or I really know how to nail that one, I'm going to do that one first and get some time up my sleeve. You know? So just a, a rough plan, not, you know, uh, it's question seven, then six, then five, then four B, one, and then I'm going to do something else. No, just a rough plan of I'm going to do these ones first and then I'm going to do these ones. Okay. Um, and finally, do not, for God's sake, sit there twiddling your thumbs waiting for perusal to finish. Start a question. In the multiple choice, there will always be at least one defined question. You can work out what it is. 
you mark it in the question booklet, not on the answer sheet, with your fingernail. Right? And it's not like this, so the invigilator comes over and wonders what you're doing. You mark it surreptitiously and you mark it in the book. The book's soft and you can mark A, B, C or D beside it right, with your fingernail. The point is, and if it's a short answer thing, um, one of the short answer questions will be explained. Start formulating a response in your head. Start drafting. The key thing is, when the supervisor says you may start writing, you want to immediately get three or four marks and turn your 90 minute paper into a 95 minute paper and think, aha, all those idiots who were just sitting there waiting for perusal, I've already got marks. Okay. Now, multiple choice. Do not make any stray marks on the multiple choice. In fact, on Mach 1 and Mach 2, I'm going to mark them as if they're the QCAA paper. So, you forget to fill in the circles, I forget to give you a mark. All right? You write anything else on that, on that page that could be in the row of the answer, you get zero. Because the scanner will look at it and say that's two answers. Okay? So if you've got to come back to a question, you do not mark it on here. You mark it in the question booklet. Put a big circle around it in the question booklet. Okay? You do not put a little X beside question 7 to come back to get it because you'll forget to rub it out and that will erase your question 7. Yep? If you um, write something out, does it still pick it up on the screen? Um, that's why they say use 2B only because 2B is soft enough with a wide eraser to get rid of it enough that the other mark is more dense for the computer to read. So where do we like write down like our thinking in multiple questions? In the book. Just in the um, question book? Yep. yep. In Mach 1 and Mach 2, um, I should not be able to reuse your multiple choice question book because they should be written all over. Okay? And I'll give you a strategy for writing all over them in a minute. Um, you need to work the questions, okay? Don't just passively read them and think, oh, B is the answer, right? You need to work them literally. Now, this is a physics example, but I, I, would, I wouldn't use a highlighter because you've got to put down your pencil to pick up a highlighter, and that's a waste of time. I would just use the pencil you've got in your hand. I would have the response sheet beside me, and it's always sitting under a ruler. The ruler is sitting on the question you are currently doing. Okay? So you don't have to go to the thing and, uh, here's question seven. You know? You just have the ruler there, and when you mark it, you move the ruler down one row, and you come back and you go to the next question. I would do the multiple choice questions in the order that they're presented, for obvious reasons. But I would underline, circle everything, you know? Um, my, my frame of mind is, you make this automatic, and I just, use this simple key. In a question, I circle everything I have to do and I underline what I have to know. So don't look at the stimulus, but look at the question itself. Right? The gradient is what I need to know and what I need to do is represent it. So what's, what does the gradient represent of this graph? Well, I go to the thing and I say, all right, well, it, I cross out the things which are obviously wrong and say, no, that's not right. That improves my chances to 50%. Out of 20, from 25%, I look at this and say, okay, A is the answer. I go to my answer sheet, I mark off A, I move it down when I go to question six. Okay. Um, now, if you're going to try and be this active in the real paper, you need to do it a thousand times beforehand to make it automatic. So don't just say, yeah, I'll do that then. I'm not going to bother in the mock. Okay. That's what the mock's there for. Start bothering. Find out what works for you. Now, I've also got things like numbers on the axes and so on. In chemistry, if this was a concentration time graph and it was an equilibrium thing, I'd be looking straight away, is this concentration or number of moles? And I'd circle it. You know, things that you want to hone in on. Be active or you'll miss them. Okay, in the short answer, um, write using blue or black pen. Now, this instruction is not in the real paper. Respond in paragraphs consisting of full sentences. Or at least, it wasn't in last year's paper. 
If it's not in last year's paper, I wouldn't follow it. If it's not in your paper, I wouldn't follow it. Um, if it is in your paper, then I would follow it. So uh, I think dot points are fine to explain questions, um, it seems. Now, this bitty, make sure you do this right. This is about how to replace an answer, okay? What you need to remember is a marker doesn't get your booklet. A marker gets the box that the question is printed inside in your booklet on a screen, okay? Now, if that does not have a single diagonal line with the words see page 27 or whatever, then they will mark what's there. Otherwise, they will have a scan off page 27 for you in front of them. Okay? So, cross it out with vertical lines and don't put C page and they'll mark what's in that box. Just want to add more to make these characters yeah, they really discourage that. Yeah. Simply because the space they give you should be completely adequate to answer the response. And if you need additional space, it probably means you're not answering the question. Okay. okay? Or you've started waffling and you haven't answered the question. Now, if you need additional space, yes, you write very clearly, see page 27. For, but uh, the instructions dissuade you from doing that. Okay? Discourage you from doing that. So once again, actively work the question, look at the cognitive verb, underline what you've got. Now, in the short response, there's a lot more to the question than what you think. This is, again, a physics example. Um, but the stem of the question will always have a cognitive verb. In this case, it's calculate, which means show you're working. Right? Um, it also has a cue, which says show you're working. Um, it has another cue down here, which is to one decimal place. Okay? It has a response space. So the answer shouldn't be any longer than that, shouldn't need to be any longer than that. But it also shouldn't be one line. And you've usually got an answer box which tells you the units. So if you don't remember the relationship, look at the units. Right? If it's moles per second or something like that, then what does that tell you about the question? Um, all of these cues you've got to use. Okay, all of these parts of the question. Because they all tell you what is going to be valued. And remember, there's no part marks. So if this is worth three marks, they're looking for three things, usually. And they will be three th really distinct things that they're looking for. If it's worth one mark, they're just looking for one thing. Now... At the end, I'm hoping that you will have time, and last year's guys did, no guarantees, but I would hope you have time. Um, so when checking, I would do this first. I would go, first of all, to those questions I thought were really easy. <coughs> and I would make sure I haven't been a dick and made a calculation error or something like that, on, or misread a question that I should get, okay? So I would go, first of all, if I've got 15 minutes to check, I'd go, first of all, to all the questions I thought were really easy and make sure that they're right, okay? Then, I would do a sweep through the paper, recalculating everything. Not just looking at the calculations, but typing it in again to make sure I hadn't mistyped something. Then, I would go and look at the questions that I didn't get earlier. I'd leave that to last because if I didn't get them 10 minutes ago, I'm probably not going to get them now. I might, so it's worth looking at, but I'm probably not going to get them. <coughs> so I shouldn't spend any a waste of time, you know. In the multiple choice, the last thing I would do is take the ruler and go down and just make sure across each line that I've only got one answer, but I have got an answer for each one. And then if I've got any time... And, and this is relying on the QCAA being competent. So it's a bit tricky. But I would look at my multiple choice and say, 
there's five C's in a row. It's unlikely that they're going to have five C's in a row. So it doesn't mean any of them are wrong. It just means I'd look at those five questions and see, have I misread something? Or if it goes A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, or something like that. You know? But given this QCAA, it could happen. Okay? The questions should be randomised, but they may not be. Okay. Um, we're going to give you a whole lot of feedback after the exam. We'll take you through how to use it all right, after each of the mocks. Now, just in terms of revision material on Moodle, I have opened up this section of external exam revision materials we could use for Mock 1, and it now has topic review questions and solutions from Pearson for each of the four major topics, okay? as well as last year's paper and solutions. Uh, but I'm just also drawing attention to, before that, on Moodle, you have already had the revision we did in January. We tried to do it in person, but I had to do it online uh, that week in January. Um, the, the revision quiz that we did when we came back, that was all on Year 11 work. Then at the end of Term 1, we did a revision day in, in um, the Easter holidays. The PowerPoint is there. And we did a whole lot of, or we gave out a whole lot of revision questions on Unit 3, the solutions of which are on Moodle. So all of that is there in the sections before you actually get to the revision section. Okay. All right. And we start that revision next period, which for you is Monday. Okay. This is what we're planning to do. See how that shape looks like a tick. We're planning to get up on this part of the tick. Okay. Okay.